Welcome, everybody. Um, I, my name is Jeff Singer. I'm a surgeon, and I'm also a senior fellow here at the Cato Institute. And um, we're here to discuss prescription drug monitoring programs. Prescription drug monitoring programs operate in all 50 states now and the District of Columbia. Uh, these statewide electronic databases of prescriptions uh, dispensed for controlled substances were originally established in response to the opioid overdose crisis. Their purpose is to facilitate drug diversion investigations by law enforcement, change prescribing behavior, and reduce what some people call doctor shopping by patients who are seeking drugs for non-medical use. In 28 states, uh, it is now mandatory for providers to access the database before each time they write a prescription for a patient to screen that patient to make sure they are not doctor shopping uh, or uh, getting too many prescriptions. Um, the trend is for that to become the rule in all 50 states. There's uh, evidence that PDMPs, as they're called, have contributed to a dramatic 40% uh, decline in prescription opioid volume since 2011. Now, PDMPs uh, presuppose that these decreasing the numbers of prescriptions will reduce the incidence of misuse addiction, or overdose. But uh, as studies have shown, including a study uh, that I co-authored that was published in the Journal of Pain Research in February, and another uh, study co-authored by uh, the Cato Institute's Jeffrey Myron, there is no correlation between prescription volume and the uh, past month's non-medical use of prescription pain relievers uh, by persons age 12 or older, nor is there any correlation between prescription volume and uh, past year diagnosed with opioid use disorder by persons age 12 or older. And uh, a recent study that was published in the BMJ by researchers at uh, uh, Harvard and Johns Hopkins followed uh, 568,000 opioid naive acute pain patients who were postoperatively given uh, prescription opioids in the Aetna database between the years 2008 and 2016 and noted a total misuse rate of 0.6%. Um, also, research published by Carice et al. in 2007, as well as uh, data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, shows that the overwhelming majority of non-medical users of prescription opioids never received them buy a prescription from a healthcare provider, but get them either from a friend, a dealer, or a relative. Um, and also, 90% of opioid overdoses, opioid-related overdose deaths, involve polypharmacy, uh, multiple other drugs, including fentanyl, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamines, and alcohol. So uh, the notion that PDMPs may reduce the opioid addiction rate is based upon the conventional view that substance or activity, that the substance or the activity is the cause of the addiction. But there are many scholars who disagree and see addiction as a learned coping mechanism based upon uh, biopsychosocial factors and etiologies. In fact, a, a study published just about a year ago now in the by the University of Pittsburgh uh, Graduate School of, of Public Health looked at numbers from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention going back as far as the 1970s and concluded that the overdoses from the non-medical use of licit and illicit drugs has been on a steady exponential increase since the, at least since the late 1970s, shows no signs of deviating from that trend. The only thing that's changed over the years is which particular drug is predominating among the causes of the overdoses. Uh, so that this was a trend already going on before the overdose, uh, overdose rate from prescription pain relievers draw the nation, drew the nation's attention. And of course now, uh, roughly 75%, according to the 2017 CDC numbers, 75% of opioid-related overdose deaths are due to heroin or fentanyl. Uh, and uh, so there's a completely uh, different makeup of which drugs are predominating among the overdose rates. As a doctor, I, first of all, I see, uh, setting aside privacy concerns, which are very important, just from a utilitarian standpoint, I could see uh, use, 
that I can make of prescription drug monitoring programs. Uh, occasionally when I'm treating a patient who I have a sus suspicion might be a malingerer seeking to basically manipulate me into prescribing uh, uh, an opioid, I'd like to know, it's nice to know that I could access a database to check to see if this person's gotten prescriptions from several other places in the last, in recent weeks. Um, so I could see its use on a case-by-case -case basis as a provider who knows which patients I'm dealing with. But, but in its current role, the way it's functioning, where I'm required in every case to check, and I'm also uh, given reports from my, my state's prescription drug monitoring board, where I'm actually uh, ranked according to my colleagues regarding how many prescriptions I've written, and I'm classified either as, in my state, as normal, outlier, or extreme outlier. This has cast a real chilling effect on me as a, as a practitioner, and I know on my colleagues, so that more and more doctors are actually now intimidated into under-prescribing. So we had a problem back in the 60s and 70s where doctors were under-prescribing. Then we were encouraged to increase our prescribing for pain medicine. Now doctors are being intimidated back into under-prescribing. Also, the mandatory aspect of the prescription drug monitoring programs, uh, as again, I'm talking as a practitioner now who's experiencing it, um, it, there's so many inconveniences involved with me having to access the database before I send in my prescription for my patient. There are multiple steps involved. I have to use a, an app on my phone with an authenticator, and then there's invariably some computer glitch where everything freezes up, and I have to get my IT person to help me but she's tied up with my colleague who's having the same problem. And by the time I get this prescription sent in, I've just eaten up 15, 20 minutes, and I'm already running an hour behind. So what ends up happening is, as a practitioner, you find yourself um, unconsciously trying to avoid even bringing up the subject of pain with your patient because you don't want to be in a situation where you have to prescribe something for it. It's just too inconvenient. Uh, so that's another way it's, in which it's had an impact on the way doctors practice. Um, there, there uh, have been s several studies done recently on the effectiveness of, of PDMPs. Uh, a study in 2017 by Nam et al. was published in the American uh, Journal of Managed Care. And uh, a, a working, a Purdue University Economics Department working paper uh, that same year by Justine Malat, both showed that while PDMPs may have decreased the prescription rate and as a result the diversion rate, they didn't seem to have any effect on the overdose rate and might indirectly be increasing the, the rate of heroin use as a result. Uh, we have a more recent study, and uh, the lead author of that study is here to talk. He's going to be the next speaker um, that, from Columbia University. It came out in May of 2018 um, that examined the same issue, and, and he will share his findings with us. Um, so in fact, with that, I'm going to use that as a uh, as a lead-in to the introduction of our speaker. Uh, so the first speaker is going to be uh, David Fink. And David Fink uh, is a researcher at Columbia University School of Public Health, and he's a doctoral candidate and, uh, in epidemiology. And uh, he's interested in the influence of social arrangements and interactions on population health. His primary focus is on the etiology of mental disorders, particularly substance use disorders, the extension of quantitative methods to estimate the health effects of policies and programs with a goal of improving population health through evidence-based policy. David has published over 50 articles and four book chapters. His research has been featured in a range of public media, including the BBC, Reuters, Washington Post, Time Magazine. Uh, so with that, let me introduce David Fink. Hey, thank you, Jeff. Um, I was asked to review in 15 minutes um, the entire body of research related to the health effects of prescription drug monitoring programs. So what I, what I want to do is go fairly quickly here. Um, and this one? All right. I want to set up the today's conversation. I'll do that through talking about the rise of prescription drug monitoring programs, what we know about these programs, a little bit about what we don't know about these programs, including some conclusions that will set up Kate Nichols talking, um, the Wesley talking, uh, and Dr. Patients. Um, and so 
when we talk about this, I think it's useful, as Jeff touched on, to talk a little bit about um, the dominant narrative of what's going on. And so if we look at this figure, this figure goes from 1999 to 2013. It shows on the y-axis the morphine milligram equivalents dispensed in millions, and we see about a 400% increase. Um, this makes a very nice figure, especially when you overlay it with opioid poisonings during that time. And we see a very similar 400% increase in opioid poisonings from 6,000 in 1999 to 26,000 in 2013. And so with the root causes of this, of this crisis seen as overprescribing, caused by liberalization of prescribing, as Jeff noted, and illegal prescribing behaviors, um, PDMPs seem like a natural solution because they can monitor both of these things. And that's particularly true in the fact that between 2003 and 2010, a substantial amount of money went into developing these programs, uh, about 50 million in total. And most of that money is actually coming from the US Bureau of Justice Assistance. And so, as we can see, these are the financial side of these things, these, pro these programs. These programs were considered largely tools of law enforcement. And so that becomes the next question of how did we move into this idea that these are tools for patient care and public health? And I think to talk about that, a lot of it comes from this 2011 report. Um, this came from the White House Office of National Drug Policy. Um, they put forth four different policy initiatives or major areas to reduce opioid abuse. Um, as they called it, is education about the harms of prescription opioid, monitoring, which is prescription drug monitoring programs, proper disposal, um, which is getting rid of excess supply, and enforcement, and that it means providing money for law enforcement personnel to go after doctor shopping, um, as they called it, and uh, pill mills. So let's focus here on prescription drug monitoring programs. Um, specifically, the report put forward four different initiatives here. We'll look at these real quick. Um, identify doctor shoppers, which is the law enforcement part. Detect therapeutic duplication and drug-drug interactions and identify patients in need of treatment. This is all fine and good. Um, but the problem is the evidence to support this recommendation was completely absent. There just wasn't any at the time. And in fact, the only thing they pulled from was a 2002 General Accounting Office report that concluded state PDMPs provide a useful tool to reduce drug diversion based largely on the opinions of prescription drug monitoring programs, managers, and law enforcement. This is all we had. And so given the, the lack of research at this time, this can kind of be seen as a general large-scale experiment of what happens when states begin to monitor prescribing behavior. Um, and this is a nationwide experiment, as we can see. So from 2001 to 2017, 73% of states um, implement, implemented a prescription drug monitoring program, with the majority of those happening um, after 2011, after that report was published. Um, so what have we learned from this? So before I move into what we know about these, I want to just clarify, make a couple points. One is that all this evidence is coming from two systematic reviews that colleagues and I completed. Um, one of them is a very general review on what the effect of these programs are, and one is a very specific review that um, Dr. Singer highlighted on the effect on non-fatal and fatal drug poisonings. Um, the other thing is I don't always provide citations, but if anyone's actually interested in the exact, the exact references, at the end I'll provide contact information. You're welcome to contact me, and I'll share those with you. Um, so I'm going to look at these in four different areas. One is the effect on prescribed behavior, diversion, non-medical use, drug use disorder, and non-fatal and fatal poisonings. Um, the other thing I want to set up is that you're going to continually see the strength of evidence. So I want to make sure everyone's on the same page. What we're talking about is the limitations of the study, you know, uh, risk of bias that comes with them, how consistent the findings are, um, reporting bias, and those will range from insufficient to high as far as the overall strength of evidence. Um, this is a very useful tool because this is what policymakers use as well, and that's why we always report it in this factor if we can. So let's begin with prescribing behavior. Again, PDMPs were really set up to uh, and advanced as a way to change prescribing behavior. Interestingly enough, the evidence is really insufficient. Um, even though 11 studies found a reduction in prescribing, two found no change, and seven actually found an increase in prescribing. Um, and so a lot of this could be due to many different changes or many different factors. One of them is the fact that six different outcomes were looked at. Um, and so some looked at mean day supply, some looked at total number of prescriptions, but the heterogeneity in this really makes it difficult to say that PDMPs are actually reducing prescribing behavior anyway. So yes, prescribing is going down, but PDMPs are just one aspect of potentially what's causing that. Um, so let's look at the second part. This is what they were set up to do. is law enforcement diversion, non-medical use. So we have two studies looking at non-medical use. Um, first is this rifler. We saw no change in PDMP states with non-medical use. Um, the second study was a much more recent one. Um, there was no change in past year initiation or any non-medical use, but there was a reduction in overall days reporting. However, with two studies, it's hard to draw conclusions from that in any case. Um, so diversion, this was the one thing that we really found an effect with. This was, you know, moderate grade evidence of a reduction. Um, for example, we'll look at this study. This was done in 2014. Um, what we're looking at is Florida. Um, 
two state two laws were passed, PDMPs and pain clinic laws, in between 2010 and 2011. And the, the, it's showing the rate of um, reported diversion in the population for these different drugs. And so this is oxycodone, for example. And so what we see is a spike in uh, reports of diversion that occur right before the PDMP and pain clinic law goes into effect, and then a slight reduction. And again, look at, if you notice it, it's a very slight reduction overall. Um, but they did find declines in oxycodone, morphine, and methadone. But let's, so then four other studies we found looked at administrative data. So now we're not just looking at um, that pain clinic law and PDMP. These ones look at uh, administrative data, finding reductions in overlapping prescriptions, reduction in multiple providers. Um, and one study using self-report data. So because it pulled from all these different data sources and found the same thing, we really found some pretty strong evidence that they do re uh, reduce diversion, which is one of the, the stated goals. Um, if we actually look at substance use disorder, this is where things get interesting to me. So with substance use disorder, there's only two studies that looked at it. One is this OLLI study that used uh, screening data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Um, and they found no association. So no change in past year substance use disorder. Again, this is substance use disorder, not opioid use disorder. So it could have been maybe done differently, but that's the limitations of the data. And then we found three different studies that all found a reduction in treatment admissions for um, substance use disorder and opioid use disorder specifically. Um, however, even though it might be reasonable to assume that a reduction in the rates of um, treatment is, or substance rate of, so, of substance use disorder is a good thing, I think it's less easy to say that a reduction in treatment use disorder is a good thing, particularly given the fact that there's no change in substance use disorder. So if substance use disorder or opioid use disorder is staying constant and treatment is going down, that actually says that we're, we're losing interaction or clinical interaction with patients that could potentially help them. Um, and then the last piece I want to go into is, again, this is the study we've already published. This is the citation to it up top. Um, since it's already been published, I'll just kind of go over the tables really quickly. Um, so the first thing is we're looking at non-fatal and fatal drug poisonings. If we look at non-fatal drug poisonings, there's only four papers published. So we really didn't have any evidence to say one way or another. Um, one thing that's unique about this section is actually do talk a little bit more about specific PDMP features. Um, this is something that some studies have done. Few studies, it's very inconsistent, so it's hard to say. Um, but again, with only four studies in total um, and three or only two studies looking at specific features, we couldn't pull anything from this. If we look at fatal drug poisonings, we actually did find low-grade evidence that PDMPs in general, yes, no, is there a PDMP in the state, reduce uh, opioid poisonings. Uh, and when we look at four specific operational features, we found the same thing. So mandatory registration, as, as Dr. Singer talked about, frequency of reporting. These are all good things. These are all things that were found to reduce opioid poisoning. Um, however, again, I always try to look at both sides of things. So one of our potential goals was to look at the unintended consequences. Um, when we looked at unintended consequences, we looked specifically at heroin poisonings. Um, in three of the six studies that investigated heroin poisoning found an increase. And these studies were later on after 2010 in particular. Um, and that's when heroin poisoning started to increase overall. And so we found bigger increases in states that had PDMPs. Um, I'll add to this, just yesterday we had a paper accepted in the International Journal of Drug Policy that actually showed a 22% increase in heroin poisoning by the third year after implementation of a prescription drug monitoring program. And this was specific to ones that we called cooperative PDMPs. A cooperative PDMP was a, state, was a program that shared data with other states, required more frequent reporting of data, um, and those that included more drug schedules. So, we can highlight or upgrade this or change this now to four out of seven studies have now shown increases in heroin poisonings. Uh, then the, the last part we'll step on here or talked about here is what don't we know about these programs? And I think this is key and, and I don't want to go too into this because uh, Kate Nicholson next will go, we'll, we'll go more into it. But what effect has these had on patient cares? Has it affected patient functioning? Has it affected patient quality of life? Um, these remain unknown. So for example, reduction in opioid prescribing may reduce or inhibit activities of daily living, quality of life. Um, and this is causing harm to the individual, which could go to population effects of how overall quality of life. However, no research to our knowledge has ever investigated these effects. And if we remember back, one of the original reasons for even implementing these programs was for this, and no study has ever even looked at this. Um, the second part is the population health piece of it. So because we don't know what effect it's having on patient care, it's hard to know what effect it's actually having on population health. Um, while the reductions in diversion that we found moderate grade evidence for seem 
good. If it's driving people into an illicit marketplace that's increasingly being mixed with fentanyl and heroin, um, overall the population health effect could be negative. It could be increasing poisonings. Um, and this is something that actually a recent modeling study showed uh, by Pitt and colleagues out in Stanford that in the, in the short term, in particular, well, over the entire 10-year period, there were increases in heroin poisoning, but actually the overall increase in poisonings, both heroin and prescription opioid, were increased in the first five years because of people most likely converting to heroin or illicit fentanyl. Um, and so the, the arc of this talk today is really that PDMPs were advanced as tools to address opioid-related harms attributed to overprescribing. Um, the evidence to support this claim we, really, we found to be insufficient. The only thing that we found sufficient was the evidence that this reduces diversion, um, which really speaks to the idea that these remain to be population health tools at this point. Um, more evidence is needed. The evidence is completely insufficient on to knowing what happens with patient care and what's happening with patient functioning. Um, two important pieces that if we're talking about these as tools of medicine and tools of population health that we need to zero in on. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me today, and I hope to be able to answer any questions if they come up. Thank you. Yeah, we'll take questions uh, okay. later. Oh, later. Yeah, yeah. We'll, do, we'll have a question and answer session uh, afterwards. Um, so let me get, uh, excuse me one second here. Well, um, close this one down. Okay, so so our next speaker is going to be uh, Kate Nicholson. Uh, Kate Nicholson is a civil rights attorney. She served in the U.S. Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division for 20 years, where she litigated and managed cases nationwide and drafted the current regulations uh, under the Americans with Disability Act. Kate developed intractable pain after a surgical mishap left her unable to sit or stand and severely limited in walking for many years. She now advocates for the appropriate treatment of pain and addiction and addressing the overdose crisis. She's a 2019 to 2020 May Day Pain and Society Fellow and the co-chair of the Chronic Pain and Opioid Task Force for the National Council on Independent Living. She regularly collaborates with, uh, with drug policy, civil rights, and disability rights organizations. Uh, Kate has published opinion pieces in the Washington Post, LA Times, Chicago Tribune, Miami Herald, The Hill, and Stat News. And she gave the TED Talk, What We Lose When We Undertreat Pain, uh, and speaks widely at universities and conferences and to physicians groups. She's also appeared on public radio, Stand Up with Pete Dominic, The Roy Green Show, and has given interviews to Fox News, Vice, BBC, and others. She was a senior fellow at Dartmouth College and is a graduate of Harvard Law School and and Kate is going to share with us the impact of PDMPs on patients. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the effect of PDMPs on patient safety. So there are a lot of concerns that have arisen about PDMPs. Um, some come from the privacy area, the fact that there are no federal protections for the data. Um, and those basically boil down to concerns about the security of the data in the systems, who has access to the data, um, and how it's being used. There are concerns about the fidelity of the data. It is subject to human input error, and there is no easy way to correct it. The data lacks context. It doesn't provide diagnostic or clinical characterization with regard to either patients or prescribers. So we don't know if someone is taking uh, a controlled substance because they have late stage MS or cancer on the one hand, and we don't know if a prescriber is a palliative care physician or a primary care physician, and we would expect them to have very different prescriber behaviors. Um, data is used to flag suspicious or aberrant behavior of providers who are characterized as overprescribers and of patients who are either characterized as overutilizers or shoppers using non transparent predictive algorithms. So if you mix in a public health crisis, an environment of oversight and fear and blame, and highly stigmatized populations of people with pain and people with addiction, what could possibly go wrong? Um, so I'm here today to talk about how PDMPs affect patients. And there are genuine risks that in the current environment, they create barriers to care for people with real medical needs. Some of the specific concerns include a chilling effect 
on the willingness of prescribers to prescribe or of patients to seek treatment because both know they're being watched. Patient abandonment, a breakdown of trust in the doctor-patient relationship, increased stigmatization, and palpable harm when people are denied medication abruptly that they are physically dependent on, um, which is very dangerous. The FDA recently issued a warning about this, that it can cause medical and psychological destabilization, suicide, and resort to illegal substances. So the basics, what are PDMPs? They are state-administered electronic databases that collect and analyze prescriptions for controlled substances. Uh, despite the data on their efficacy being characterized as mixed and inconclusive, they have proliferated recently. They are now in all 50 states and many US territories. And state laws vary in terms of what's captured, but all states identify the drug, the quantity, the number of days that quantity is supposed to last, the date dispense, and prescriber, pharmacy, and patient identifiers. Uh, so this is a, the, the tough thing about PDMPs is they straddle two spheres, um, law enforcement and clinical practice. There are many doctors and the CDC that see the ideal version of what a PDMP could do. They can provide information about potentially dangerous drug interactions or monitor how patients are using their medications or identify patients who are at risk, and they are considered universal precautions. But PDMPs are also tools for surveillance and oversight. They are aimed at identifying suspicious behavior, potential misuse, and diversion. So they're used to track and suppress the dispensing of controlled substances, which is a core enforcement policy uh, goal of, of drug enforcement. So PDMPs, as one author has said, really blur the lines between healthcare and law enforcement. Um, the biggest problem with PDMPs for patients is um, how the data are used. So the flagging of patients can present immediate barriers to care, such as when someone shows up and tries to fill a prescription and that prescription is denied. Um, and the flagging of physicians can create downstream burdens on patients, such as patient abandonment. Patients are basically flagged on one of two categories. One is they're flagged as overutilizers. But the definitions on what an overutilizer is vary widely. Under some of our laws, if someone has filled two prescriptions in a 12-month period, they are an overutilizer. So you're looking at someone who would have been considered an overutilizer for most of my career. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I suffered a surgical injury to my spinal cord that left me unable to sit or stand or walk, um, except with a mobility aid for very short distances for about 15 years. I was in an extraordinary amount of pain. Um, I tried 30 different, seven different kinds of pain treatments. I really didn't want to try opioids. Uh, but eventually, when everything else failed, I did. And they really helped me uh, continue to work and function under really difficult circumstances. And then uh, many years later, when surgical techniques improved, I improved and got off of them without any problem or incident. But I would definitely have been considered an overutilizer by these definitions. Um, the other aspect is shopping. So a primary goal of PDMPs is to root out shopping. And what that is is when patients go either from pharmacy to pharmacy or doctor to doctor trying to get more medication than is really medically in indicated for their condition. So to stop that, PDMPs flag the number of providers somebody sees. And my question is, um, that, that's sort of a proxy for misuse, but are they really accurate? Because there are other reasons that people might have um, multiple providers. For example, uh, what we call care deserts. The outgoing president of the American Medical Association uh, got up at the last of their interim meeting, um, and she's a cancer doctor, and she told a story about a patient she had who had late stage prostate cancer that had spread to his bones. He was in a lot of pain, and so she prescribed medication for him. But she was in a city, and he was in a rural area, so she prescribed through his primary care provider. And when this gentleman went in to fill his prescription, the pharmacist refused to fill it. She said he was a drug seeker because he had multiple providers, um, and, and she just wasn't going to fill his prescription. And he was an older gentleman who felt very ashamed, and so he just went home and tried to endure his pain, but he was unable to, and three days later, he tried to kill himself. So multiple providers can happen in academic settings too. Um, it's not just the sort of rural versus urban. Not everyone just sees one doctor. Um, and it, ironically, in the current environment, we're actually encouraging people 
to uh, participate in the very behavior that we're monitoring people for. So for example, most people, if they went to a, a pharmacy and wanted to fill a prescription and the pharmacy denied it and they weren't allowed to pay, would probably go to another pharmacy and try and fill it there. But then they're getting logged. It's going to multiple pharmacies. And if someone is abandoned by their doctor, they're probably going to go find another doctor. But then they're getting multiple prescribers. So we're actually encouraging this behavior. And of course, the complications are even higher for marginalized populations. There was a, an epic study that Dr. Carmen Green did that showed um, that even um, when, uh, even, even factoring income in, that opioids are far less available and stocked in pharmacies in black neighborhoods than they are in white neighborhoods. Um, and now there's emerging evidence that PDAMPs may be constraining prescribing. Um, a recent study found that more often this happened with shoppers, but that there were economically significant reductions in prescribing to patients without any kind of suspicious history. Um, so providers are also flagged in using this data. Um, this is just a quote that I pulled off of Twitter from a doctor who had just gotten his regular report from his state's prescription monitoring program. Um, uh, this is a photograph of a letter that went out from U.S. attorney's offices in Atlanta. It also happened in Wisconsin. Um, and uh, it's basically um, what constitutes an overprescriber is not really defined anywhere. In fact, it's only this recent support act that uh, sort of has directed uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services to define what an overprescriber is. And so again, proxies are used. Um, and there was a recent interview uh, with uh, lawyers from the Justice Department who basically said the way we've been able to get these doctors is through this data mining now. And, and um, we found that they have prescribed in doses higher than what the CDC recommends. But the CDC just clarified that, these are, that their guideline and what they recommend, which is really for how you start a new patient on opioids, is being widely misapplied. Um, so this is actually a misinterpretation. And yet doctors are being sent letters saying, you're prescribing more than your peers. Stop. And of course, doctors are under a lot of other layers of oversights. There are state laws. Payers have enacted policies. Pharmacy chains have enacted policies. Medical boards are looking at these behaviors. Um, and I think this nice quote from the Health and Justice Lab that's led by uh, Professor uh, Leo Boletsky um, at Northeastern sort of sums up what's happening with physicians. He says, I think physicians currently believe that their prescribing practices are now vulnerable to being monitored. And unlike other aspects of their care and treatment, how they prescribe to a given patient is there for everyone to see. However, the reasons they prescribed it, the carefulness of their monitoring, and the effectiveness for the patient, that's not there. So what are the downstream effects of provider surveillance? Well, there was a recent study in the Journal of the American Medical Association that found that 40% of primary care doctors now will not see a chronic pain patient who uses opioids. And most studies show that some 13 million Americans use opioids long-term for pain. So this stands to affect a lot of people. Human Rights Watch issued um, a report at the end of last year on what's happening uh, to patients. They found that clinicians were tapering people, that is, reducing their dosages or taking them off of opioids involuntarily. And they were doing so out of fear of liability and even against their better clinical judgment. So these things are becoming sort of a substitute for clinical judgment. Here's a quote from one of the doctors. I turn away new patients. These are folks whose records checked out. They are good citizens. But I can't afford to burn down my life and lose my license. Uh, there's another recent study that just showed that even people who are working in state law enforcement agencies are expressing concerns that PDMPs are creating barriers to accessing care for people with medical needs. Um, and I don't have a lot of time, but I have seen this before. So I started my career in the Justice Department during the HIV and AIDS epidemic. And uh, we had to win the right to sort of, of, of people with HIV and AIDS just to go to the dentist all the way in the Supreme Court because there was so much fear and so much misreporting about what was going on. And that was the situation in which all public health authorities agreed there was an infinitesimal risk of transmission that was mitigated by universal precautions. Um, the evidence that's come down this year on what's happening to patients in practice is really chilling. Uh, there was a study of Medicare be beneficiaries in Vermont who are at high daily doses, 
and the immediate length of time to discontinuation was one day. Now remember, this is a really dangerous practice. It's going to throw people into withdrawal. 49% had an opioid-related hospitalization or emergency room visit. There was a study that Kaiser Permanente did in Colorado that showed that just destabilizing dose, just trying to bring someone down, it resulted in a three-fold increase of an opioid-related death. There was a study in New York that showed that opioid discontinuation was associated with dissolution and care relationships. And there have been two recent studies that have basically shown the same things. So because I've been out there very publicly with my own story, um, I hear from patients every day. And these are just sort of examples of the emails I get. I've gotten 10 this morning. Um, I hear from patients who are acutely suicidal. I'm a pain patient who can no longer get treatment for my pain caused by a spinal cord injury. I do not want to end my life. I want to live. But if I can't get help from someone somewhere, I will not be here next week. I hear from families who've lost loved ones. My brother passed away. Over the last year, his doctors began to significantly cut his pain medicine. He was truly at the end of his rope. Most often, I hear from people whose lives have been severely disrupted. I was independent. Now I have to get my kids to help me because I am bedridden. So I get disability now, and I lost my house. Or the tears, grieving, and financial loss cannot be described with my husband bedridden in immense pain. I am so tired now, and we are financially devastated. I also hear from patients who, are gonna who suggest that they may resort to illegal substances. And this was from a really kind gentleman who is a veteran who basically said, I've never so much just smoked a cigarette, but I'm desperate. Um, and I've just written here, I mean, he's basically broken almost every bone in his body. These are people with really serious conditions and who are basically being denied care. So I want to close by saying um, something about APRIS and NARCScare. Um, APRIS is a data analytics firm. Um, they describe their purpose, at least in terms of their health department, as helping providers make better informed decisions. So we're back to this sort of laudable goals of what PDMPs could be in theory. Um, they are a private vendor that holds the majority of PDMPs. 34 states use them. And they assign patients what's called a NARCS care score that purports to indicate their potential risk. We don't know the factors that go into this score because they claim the algor algorithm is proprietary. So we have a private company using a consciously non-transparent algorithm to determine how patients are perceived and treated. And I have a quick case study. This is a 53-year-old woman. She has failed back surgery syn syndrome from a surgical error. And in some ways, hers was worse than mine because they actually performed the wrong surgery on her and removed part of her spine. She also has other conditions that can cause pain. From 2009 to 2017, she received care from a single pain management practice, but it had a rotating staff of PAs and MDs. So that resulted in her having seven prescribers on her PDMP. In 2017, the head of the practice closed the practice. A group came in to transition, gave people two different prescribers, so that added two more. Um, now she's in a new pain management practice, which also has two MDs and a PA. So now she's got 12 prescriptions um, on her, prescribers on her PDMP file. And uh, in 2019, she was alerted to an error. The current prescriber was listed twice, once with a first and last name, and once with a middle initial. So she has a total of 13 prescribers on her PDMP. And normally, patients won't ever know this information. Her prescriber actually shared it with her. So she has a really high NARCS care score, 522. That's about as high as it can get. Only about 5% of patients have a score that high. But she's never had aberrant actions. She's never failed a urine drug test. She's never called on a weekend or emergency for more pain medicine. She's passed all the standards required by her pain management contract. And no provider has ever believed she ever misused the medication. The total number of practices she sought care from was two. But she can't find a primary care doctor because of her NARCS care score. And she was recently denied treatment at an emergency room when she went passing a kidney stone uh, because they said they didn't even admit her. They, gave, they did give her a prescription for a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, but they said, we, you know, the only reason we'd admit you is for pain care and we won't treat you because of your NARCS care score. So this all begs the question, what happens when tools that are designed in theory for safety end up doing harm? If the goal is to end overdoses, as we've seen, there's no consensus that PDMPs in practice help. And some argue that it's made things worse. 
Um, there are really serious concerns for those who are actually suspected of having an opioid use disorder or misuse. There are no protocols for securing alternative treatment or for streamlining care among clinicians. Um, things could actually get much worse because right now um, there is under consideration um, taking away the privacy protections for people who are in opioid uh, treatment. Um, SAMHSA has an open, open call for comments right now. Um, so rather than extending privacy protections to everyone uh, whose data is mined in the PDMP system, we're now actually thinking about taking away from the one category of patients who are probably most vulnerable. Uh, in conclusion, PDMPs are here to stay, but we really do need protections to address the abuses that can flow from them. Thank you. I'll add, uh, in my state of Arizona, um, we, uh, the, the pharmacy board uh, oversees our PDMP, and practitioners get a quarterly report, and it's broken down by specialty. So um, uh, I get compared to other general surgeons in my, uh, uh, regarding, but it's just on a raw number of prescriptions. It's not adjusted on a per capita basis. So it'll tell me this is how many uh, hydrocodone prescriptions you wrote this quarter. This is how many oxycodone prescriptions you wrote this quarter. This is how you compare to other people in your specialty in this state during the same quarter. And you're categorized as normal, outlier, or extreme outlier. Now, if you're a busy sur surgeon seeing, doing 20 operations a week, you're going to write more pain medicine prescriptions than if you're in a part-time practice doing four, three or four operations a, a week. But there's no adjustment for that, just based on the numbers of prescriptions you write. And when you see that you're suddenly an outlier, that makes you very nervous, especially when you know, you're reading the news every day about some doctor being arrested. So that, that, I'm just giving my personal experience on that. Um, uh, now we're going to move into uh, a, a completely different area, which is the area of privacy and uh, Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, our next speaker will be Nathan Fried Wessler. He's a staff attorney at the ACLU Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project, where he focuses on litigation and advocacy, and advocacy around surveillance and privacy issues, including use of surveillance technologies. In 2017, he argued Carpenter versus the United States in the US Supreme Court, a case that established that the Fourth Amendment requires law enforcement to get a search warrant before requesting cell phone location data from a person's cellular service provider. Nate also litigated several cases involving Fourth Amendment protections for sensitive prescription records in state PDMPs, and he's involved in one right now in New Hampshire. So I will give it over to Nathan. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, so, so yeah, I, the, the angle on this issue that I look at and I think about are protections against unjustified law enforcement access. Uh, as with all the issues I work on around digital age surveillance issues, I'm concerned with uh, what are the appropriate limits that need to be placed before police officers or other law enforcement agents can get access uh, to this repository of highly sensitive medical information. Uh, so I, I want to start with a, a story that I think illustrates the dangers of, uh, of under-regulated law enforcement access to this data, uh, and then talk about the national landscape, and then some of the Fourth Amendment litigation uh, that I and my colleagues are involved in. Uh, so in 2013, uh, in Utah, a, a few paramedics working uh, for the Unified Fire Authority, which is a big regional fire and rescue district uh, uh, encompassing most of the suburbs around Salt Lake City, discovered that a few morphine vials in ambulances had been tampered with. Uh, morphine had been taken out, and saline put back in to replace it. Uh, they reported this to the supervisors, who then reported it to the local police. Uh, police did a normal investigation. They interviewed paramedics and others who had access to those ambulances, couldn't figure out who might have done it. Uh, so the investigation was more or less at a dead end when one enterprising local police officer uh, decided to use his access privileges to the Utah Controlled Substance Database, it's the name of the PDMP in Utah, uh, to log in. Now, at that time, in 2013, any law enforcement agent in the state could get their own login credentials. And just uh, by, uh, after logging in, that's the login screen as it existed at that time in Utah, log right in, check a little box, uh, click a, a box that said, uh, this is part of my uh, authority uh, or part of my activities as a law enforcement officer, and then run any query they wanted. So this officer uh, decided to download the complete prescription histories of all 480 firefighters, paramedics, administrative professionals, supervisors in this fire district, 
and sort through them to see whether any of their controlled substance prescribing histories suggested that maybe they were the ones who'd taken the morphine. Uh, he didn't see anything that suggested uh, a suspect in the crime under investigation, uh, but he decided not to stop there and to see whether he could find anything else interesting or incriminating uh, in the prescription histories of those 480 people. Uh, and he ended up focusing in on these two men, Ryan Pyle, who's uh, on the left, uh, he's a firefighter and paramedic, and Marlon Jones on the right, uh, who was an assistant fire chief, uh, who had uh, gotten different prescriptions for narcotic painkillers from different prescribers. This is the multiple prescriber situation. This police officer, without any particular medical training or training in these kind of controlled substance investigations, decided that looked suspicious. He thought they were malingerers uh, who were illegally obtaining, fraudulently obtaining uh, opioid prescriptions. So he referred it to a local prosecutor who took a look at the case and declined to prosecute. Then he found a, a state prosecutor in the state AG's office who would take the case. Uh, they filed charges of, uh, against uh, both of these men. Um, there was a, a drawn out series of pretrial uh, hearings uh, stretching well over a year during which uh, both of these guys' names were all over the local press as drug addicts and as disgraces to their department. They both had to go out on, on paid leave. Uh, it, it was totally mortifying for them. Uh, Mr. Pyle and his wife were in the process of adopting a second child. Uh, the adoption almost went off the rails because he was now accused of a felony. Um, eventually, the prosecutor dropped the, the uh, charges against both of them, uh, again, after mo more than a year, after it became clear what should have been clear at the, the start, that these were completely reasonable and medically necessary prescriptions. Uh, for one of them, he had a prescription from one doctor to treat a motorcycle injury and another doctor uh, to treat a bone infection following a dental procedure. Uh, for the other uh, firefighter, uh, there was an on-the-job back injury, double knee replacements that a, another surgeon had done, uh, and he had gout that a, a third prescriber had been treating. Uh, all the prescribers knew what the other ones had done. Uh, everything was above board. But this police officer, because he had such easy access, decided he should take action, uh, which resulted in, uh, in a really terrible set of events for, for these men. Uh, so this helps show why we should care about some limits on law enforcement access uh, to what is an incredibly sensitive trove of data. Uh, and it's not just that it can lead to these kinds of unjustified investigations and prosecutions that can have really terrible effects on people's lives. Uh, it's also, as you've heard already, that it can lead to a risk of chilling people from even going to the doctor to seek necessary medication in the first place, can chill prescribers, doctors, from issuing prescriptions to patients who really need it. Um, and I think it's important, really important to remember that when we're talking about the controlled substances that are tracked in these databases, it's not just the opioid painkillers, those certainly are, but it's also all the other medications that are classified as controlled substances under state and federal law. So that includes things like lots of psychiatric medications, Xanax, Valium, things prescribed all the time for depression, for panic disorders, uh, for uh, anxiety disorders, for attention uh, deficit disorder, um, things like the synthetic cannabinoids, like Marinol, taken by cancer and AIDS patients who have suppressed appetites to try to stimulate appetite. Uh, testosterone, taken by many transgender men or by people with testosterone deficiencies. Uh, Suboxone or Librium, which are taken often as part of treatment for uh, drug or alcohol addiction. These are medications that when you see that someone has been prescribed it, you can tell pretty reliably what the underlying medical diagnosis is. And of course, we have a whole framework in this country and a long tradition in the medical tradition, uh, the medical profession, of protecting the confidentiality of exactly that kind of information. And yet here it is, uh, without legal regulation, free for the taking in these databases. Um, Utah is, is far from an isolated uh, example, that Utah case, uh, of law enforcement access to these databases. Uh, so a few years ago, the Scripps News Service did a, a fantastic nationwide investigation into the frequency of law enforcement requests for this data. Uh, with public records requests to uh, agencies in all 50 states. Uh, and they found that in a two-year period, 2014 to 2015, law enforcement agencies accessed at least 344,921 patient prescription histories in PDMPs. So that's more than 57,000 in Texas over those two-year periods, uh, 50,000 in Indiana, 43,000 in Ohio, 38,000 in Oklahoma, uh, 26,000 in Pennsylvania, 10,000 in West Virginia. Uh, this is a lot of incursion into people's medical information. Um, and that trend has continued. So more, more recent uh, study 
uh, that's in process, but um, the results of some public records requests at the ACLU Massachusetts and the, uh, the Health and Action Lab at Northeastern University Law School uh, did show that in a, a more recent two-year period in Massachusetts, there were about 11,000, a uh, little more than 11,000 requests by law enforcement for patient prescription data uh, in this database. Uh, now states, as a matter of state statutes, deal with this question of how easy or difficult it should be for law enforcement to get these records in very different ways. Uh, so a number of states, uh, this slide again is from that Scripps News investigation, um, a, a number of states, like Utah did in 2013, just allow police officers to have their own logins, and they just have to self-certify that they're doing something within the scope of their duties as a police officer, and they can run their own queries. Uh, there's another set of states that have to, that require the agency that runs the PDMP to run the query themselves, but they'll do it any time a police officer asks. Um, other states require a subpoena, which is still not a great protection. It's essentially a piece of paper that the police fill out and send over, self-certifying that, uh, that the information they're looking for is relevant to an investigation, which is a very low standard under the law. Uh, there's a small set of states uh, like New York and Pennsylvania and some others that require uh, a court order, but on a low legal standard, relevance or reasonable suspicion. And then there are about a dozen or so states that as a matter of state law require police to go to a judge, demonstrate probable cause, and get a search warrant or a similar court order uh, before getting, uh, being allowed to access patient records in this database. Um, that's sort of the, the gold standard protection. That's the protection that the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution talks about, uh, getting a warrant based on probable cause uh, before police are allowed to access our most private spaces or our most private information. Um, and that warrant protection, it turns out, really makes a difference in cutting out the fishing expeditions and the unjustified requests by police and forcing them to focus just on the investigations uh, where they really have evidence that there is uh, actual illegal activity. So, so there's data from Utah. Uh, so it, after uh, that ordeal that those two firefighters suffered, uh, the state legislature amended the Utah law after um, advocacy by the firefighters union and the ACLU and a libertarian group in Utah called Libertas uh, and others, uh, advocacy to convince the legislature to raise the bar to require a warrant before police could get access. Uh, and the uh, Auditor General of the state uh, did a, a study and found that in the six month period leading up to implementation of that warrant requirement, uh, there were um, almost 3,000 law enforcement searches of the state PDMP. Uh, in the six months after that warrant requirement went into effect, there were about 70 searches, uh, a real drop. Uh, police were still able to access the data when they really needed it, but police weren't able to just log in uh, on a hunch or a whim and download this data from people. So the, the work that I've been involved in in this area uh, is looking at um, what the Fourth Amendment says, regardless of what the state law protections are, what the Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution says about law enforcement access to this data. Uh, and this has arisen in a, a number of states in litigation that we've been involved in, uh, including in states that actually have a warrant requirement as a matter of state law. And that's because the DEA uh, takes the position that as a federal agency, they're not bound by state law as a matter of federal preemption law. Uh, and so even in states like Utah now, or like Oregon, or New Hampshire, or the others with a warrant requirement, the DEA takes the position that they can access this data and force the state to comply with the issuance of just an administrative subpoena. Here's an example of one. Uh, but as I noted earlier, a subpoena is just a piece of paper sent by the law enforcement agency where they self-certify that they are seeking information relevant to a law enforcement investigation. Uh, in several of these states that have been receiving these subpoenas after implementing state law warrant requirements, the states have pushed back and said, we can't comply with the subpoena. This would force us to violate our own state law. This isn't a warrant. Uh, uh, that happened first in Oregon, uh, then in a case in Utah. Uh, where uh, I represented individual people in those states to intervene in the case to vindicate their own privacy rights alongside the state. Um, the government's, uh, federal government's arguments in both of those cases uh, was primarily that uh, this doctrine called the third party doctrine governed and meant that no warrant was required. Uh, this is a legal principle that stems from some, uh, some Supreme Court cases in the 1970s that supposes that once people have shared private information with a so-called third party, meaning a company they do business with or some other entity, they're considered to have lost all of their Fourth Amendment protections. They've given up their reasonable expectation of privacy in that data by sharing it. Uh, and therefore, if police go to the quote unquote third party, in this case, the state PDMP, uh, 
uh, without a warrant, that person can't complain because it's no longer their data. It's held by someone else. So the DEA's argument in these cases has been, well, you told your doctor what your ailment was, so that's your first disclosure. Then you, quote unquote, disclosed your prescription slip to the pharmacist, that's your second disclosure. And now the pharmacist, as mandated by state law, has reported it to the secure state database. So you've now three times over disclosed this information, you've given up your privacy interest in it, uh, therefore we can get it without a warrant. Um, we fought that logic, uh, arguing that under the Fourth Amendment, uh, there should be greater protections because of the sensitivity of this data. Uh, and one in uh, district court in Oregon, lost in district court in Utah. Um, and then a few years after those cases, uh, we successfully litigated a case in the US Supreme Court about a different kind of data held by third parties, cell phone location information, uh, where the court put really critical limits on this third party doctrine and explained that that can't be the rule in the digital age. Some kinds of new forms of sensitive digital data just require new protections and a warrant. Uh, and so we're now involved in litigation in New Hampshire, uh, arising out of the same situation. New Hampshire has a warrant requirement, DEA sending subpoenas. New Hampshire is trying to, to protect its residents' privacy rights and resisting those subpoenas, saying get a warrant instead. Uh, and we have gotten involved saying this third party doctrine can apply here. And now we have this new precedent from the Supreme Court saying that we have to actually look at the sensitivity of that information, look at whether it truly was voluntarily shared or not. And in a case like this where we have information that is necessarily created. You can't avoid going to your doctor if you have an urgent uh, or chronic medical condition. And that is so highly sensitive. This is you know, the, the core of medical confidentiality. In that situation, at least when you have this huge statewide database that makes this information super easily available to law enforcement, unless there are legal protections, the warrant requirement of the Fourth Amendment must apply. Uh, so, so that's what we're litigating uh, now. Uh, that case out of New Hampshire is going to be argued next week in the First Circuit Court of Appeals up in Boston. Uh, it's one of the early uh, opportunities of a court to interpret that Carpenter decision about cell phone data in another context of different kinds of sensitive uh, digital data uh, that exist out there. And we think it's a really powerful place to be challenging that doctrine because the sensitivity of this information is so intense. Uh, and we hope that, uh, that judges will share the intuition of, I think, most people in this country that when it comes to medical records, you know, a slip of paper self-issued by a law enforcement agency just isn't an adequate protection. Okay, thank you. So uh, our next speaker is Dr. Patience Moyo. Dr. Moyo is an assistant professor of health services policy and practice at Brown University School of Public Health. She's trained as a pharmaceutical health services researcher and has interests in prescription drug use and safety, pain management, substance use disorders, and health, day, health outcomes research. Her main research is focused on analysis of large administrative data sets, including Medicare, Medicaid, and VA data, to study epidemiology, quality of prescribing, and policy issues related to opioids. A graduate of Mount Holyoke College, uh, she obtained her PhD from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, where her dissertation examined the role of prescription drug monitoring program implementation and policy features on opioid prescribing in Medicare. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh Health Policy Institute in the Center for Pharmaceutical Policy and Prescribing, and during that time also had a research affiliation with the VA Pittsburgh Center for Health Equity and Research Promotion. Dr. Moyo. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Singer, for the invitation to speak on this panel this afternoon. Um, I will be speaking about the role and effectiveness of prescription drug monitoring programs in the opioid crisis. This is the outline for my talk this afternoon. I won't go into these individually right now, but just so you see it. Um, as many of you are probably aware, PDMPs are one of many approaches to address the opioid crisis. Um, and as other panelists have talked about before me, they really serve to, um, like they are a data set and that data is made available to different types of authorized users. Predominantly those authorized users are prescribers, but they are other users such as law enforcement um, and even medical and pharmacy licensure boards as you've heard. Um, and so I will move from that quickly. 
PDMPs vary in terms of how they are structured and how they are used. In this map, um, based on survey data from PDMP administrators, it, with, this is data updated in July 2019. It shows us that um, across the country, most of the PDMPs are operated out of pharmacy boards, as you can tell, and followed by departments of health. We do see that there's about four states that are up operated out of um, law enforcement agencies. And so as you can imagine, the type of um, agency that operates the PDMP may have an impact on the types of uses that the PDMP data um, is made available for. And um, the variations exist beyond the governing agency of the PDMP. And here I, I have different um, other characteristics by which PDMPs may vary. And ultimately, all these features then contribute to how rigorously the PDMP is run as a whole, which in the end may have an, an impact on how effective that program is. Um, as much as uh, PDMPs differ across states, they, they have also differed over time as PDMPs have largely implemented features that are really more rigorous um, over time. Um, and so someone mentioned earlier about increases in states that are mandating prescribers to check the database. And so that's, um, the lines are pretty hard to tell, but the blue line over there is, shows that. Um, and I also want to point out the increases in states that are participating in proactive reporting um, of PDMP data. And this could be whether the state um, is permitted by legislation to participate in proactive reporting or required. And this proactive reporting is, it's a form of data dissemination by the PDMPs. And you could think about this dissemination um, in sort of two different types of ways. They're, they're the solicited reports that are generated um, at the direct request of an authorized person carrying out their professional responsibilities. And um, the majority of the solicited reports are initiated by healthcare providers. On the other end, you have unsolicited or proactive reports. And these are um, reports that the PDMP operating agency identifies based on who is considered an outlier or who, is, who has questionable prescribing, dispensing, or, pay, or purchasing activity. And as others have pointed out earlier, there, there's wide variation in terms of how those outliers are, are, are identified. And then those findings of the outliers are then sent to um, authorized users um, from the PDMP. And those authorized users can range from uh, prof professional licensing bodies to prescribers, um, dispensers, and law enforcement. And so as you can imagine, these um, un unsolicited reports can definitely be a source of um, angst, both for the providers as well as the patients. Um, this map shows PDMP reports to prescribers, and I really want to point out that the majority of states do participate in unsolicited reporting. Um, those are the states that are identified in blue on this map. And then um, in, in terms of access to PDMP data by law enforcement, again, this is a map from the PDMP train, um, Technical and Training Assistance Center, Center and it shows that um, most, most states actually provide solicited, solicited data to law enforcement. There are fewer states that provide both solicited and unsolicited data to law enforcement agency, agencies. But there are lots of nuances in terms of um, the type of data access that PDMPs grant to law enforcement. And this, can, this might differ depending on who's requesting the data. Is it a prosecutor? Is this for corrections, drug courts, types of things? And there are also different types of PDMP reports that these states generate. Um, for example, you see in this map that the, the types of PDMP reports range from those that are the most comprehensive, for instance, providing both providing patient, prescriber, dispenser histories, as well as the query audit trail. So those are the states in blue. So that's the most comprehensive data that the state would provide to law enforcement. Um, and then other states do not provide um, any level of access to law enforcement. 
And so privacy, um, PDMPs are mandatory. So if someone receives a, a, a controlled substance that, that's monitored by their state PDMP program, they cannot opt out of having their data recorded in these systems. And in Missouri, this has been described as potentially unconstitutional and contributed to the challenges in that state in terms of creating a statewide PDMP. Um, and I, in, in preparing for this talk, I came across a, a paper um, with this title. And there's a, a line in that paper that says, if PDMPs worked to reduce the number of deaths, then Missouri should be at the top of the list, saying that you know at the time, Missouri did not have a statewide PDMP program. And so if PDMPs had worked, that state would then have had the greatest number of prescription opioid overdose deaths, based off of the correlation that over time, as PDMPs have become implemented, we've also seen parallel increases in um, overdose fatalities. And so what I say to that is that that, that is really an oversimplification in terms of understanding the potential effectiveness of prescription drug monitoring programs. And um, we do really need to think about um, important considerations, some of which have been brought up um, by other speakers before me, including um, the difficulty in terms of evaluating PDMP effectiveness in the context of very different outcomes. And so when we talk about the effectiveness of prescription drug monitoring programs in the opioid crisis, we need to be very clear in terms of which specific outcomes we are talking about. Is it opioid prescribing within which you could talk about uh, prescribing to new users or you could talk about the prescribing of, say, Schedule II opioids, for instance, and you might see different patterns there. Um, or are you talking about diversion or o overdose death? And so it's very important to be clear on the specific outcomes that we're considering for effectiveness. Um, and then we, PDMPs also vary substantially in terms of how they're operated and they've changed over time. And so that, again, is an important consideration in figuring out how effective, how effective PDMPs are. Because in one state with certain features, it may have a different impact compared to a separate state with different features. And most of the analyses that we have, they do rely on state-specific um, analyses as well. Um, and additionally, they, there's a multiplicity of contributing factors to the opioid crisis, and there's also a multiplicity of co-occurring interventions and policies that um, are being implemented, and this makes it really challenging to really identify and isolate the, the impact of the PDMPs just by themselves. And then now I'll talk a little bit about the PDMPs in terms of benefits and concerns. Um, and some of the benefits um, may be the ideal benefits and may not be fully realized. Um, I recognize that. But PDMPs do have uh, potential benefits in, in serving as clinical decision support tools to improve patient care through safer prescribing. Um, and so I know some states are in, engaged in data analytic projects right now to ensure that PDMPs um, have flags to monitor the inner potential harmful drug interactions, for example, opioids and benzodiazepines. And it, as a whole, that can definitely improve patient safety. Also, um, PDMP data um, is really um, not fragmented in terms of you know, different payer sources. It captures data from um, all payer types, whether it's private insurance or public insurance and cash payments. And in the current healthcare system right now, there's a lot of healthcare fragmentation. Um, and so this unique setup with the prescription drug monitoring programs has the potential to really um, harmonize that data for a more comprehensive um, uh, data capture that will support the clinical decision support function that I just mentioned. Um, and also, there's the potential um, for PDMPs in reducing pill mills and multiple provider use, which, um, as Kate Nicholson mentioned, we, we don't really know if all multiple provider use is bad or not. And so there's definitely um, potential concern in that area as well. 
um, and concerns. These have been mentioned by others here, including the chilling effect on prescribing, resulting in poorly managed pain. Um, reduced opioid availability raises concerns about transition to illicit drugs. Um, the data uh, interface itself ha has poor features in terms of usability um, for clinicians, for example. Indeed, the data also is subject to misinterpretation and misapplication, um, and that can infringe on patient privacy um, and, phys and physician autonomy. Also, PDMPs do not address um, heroin or synthetic opioids, which are um, responsible for much of the current over um, overdose deaths that we're experiencing. And so in terms of um, some ideas on how to balance the mission of PDMPs with concerns. So the first concern that I will talk about is with regard to prescription opioid availability. There's data to suggest that opioid prescriptions declined by 29% from 2011 to 2017. And this has implications in terms of pain management. Um, and so potential ways to um, balance this concern would be to incentivize appropriate prescribing rather than reducing all prescribing, regardless of whether it's beneficial or not beneficial. And so with the nuanced considerations of um, patient sub subgroups, for instance, who may be um, doing well on opioid therapy, that's something that needs to be considered as well, um, as well as thinking about um, improved coverage for non-opioid and non-drug non complements and alternatives. Um, I'll also point out that PDMPs are largely opioid-centric, um, but they do have the capacity to um, monitor other su substances as well, and this is something that's um, relevant given that there is a broader problem of addiction at play. It's not just about the opioid. Um, and then um, regarding concerns around data dissemination, um, there's an expanding set of PDMP authorized users and also PDMP authorized uses. And this is something that raises the, concern, the concerns around uh, data privacy and security. Um, and so my thoughts about this are that the, the problem really isn't that the PDMP data exists, um, but the problem is in how the data is used. And so as far as we can think about ways to reduce the misapplication of PDMP data, um, then that would be beneficial um, in terms of applying the appropriate um, criteria and safeguards for who, when, and why, and how. Um, people access um, PDMP data and how much data is shared um, when that happens. And then in terms of um, PDMPs as a clinical decision support tool, this has a data dissemination aspect to it as well because um, there are reports that sometimes providers don't find the, the information that's provided to be helpful or presented in a manner that um, can be easily digested. And so these, there, there are deliberate efforts that need to be um, done in, in terms of enhancing the content and its presentation and also reinforcing um, messages of um, provider autonomy in terms of, you know, if someone queries the PDMP, um, there should be a stronger message that, you know, they still have the autonomy to provide the care that is best for the patient in that context. And then with regards to PDMP use mandates, they do have the potential to increase um, the burden on, on providers. And so uh, finding ways to better target those mandates to certain prescriber types or certain contexts um, of care would be something um, relevant, as well as finding ways to integrate the PDMP data with electronic health records to, to improve, um, um, the um, to fit in better with the clinical workflow. And then there are potential consequences of um, failing to appropriately use PDMP data that are in, that in some cases may be realized or in other cases perceptions among providers. And so again, I think there's, there needs to be potentially more training in terms of the context in which the proactive reports that I mentioned earlier are sent um, and to who those reports are sent to, as well as, again, greater emphasis on um, physician autonomy in providing the best care for the patients. <laughs> 
And then the last point here I'll make in terms of balancing the mission of PDMPs with concerns is around uh, patient abandonment um, that Kate Nicholson mentioned, um, because um, patients who are fired by their prescriber or are forced to taper from their opioids may turn to illicit opioid markets. And um, there's a, a paper that wrote that came out last year, and the authors had this sentence in it. It says that um, is, if this shift um, happens on a broad scale in nationally, PDMP benefits in reducing death from prescription opioids will be canceled out by increasing deaths from heroin and fentanyl. And so um, this definitely places an emphasis on finding ways to ensure that um, you know, for the patients that are, that in, in terms of reducing the abandonment of patients, and one way to do that is to ensure that physicians are trained on how to engage patients, for example, those who are filling multiple prescriptions, um, to appropriate care for substance use disorders, if that's the care that they need. Um, and that could mean those providers actually getting training or waivers to prescribe Suboxone and delivering that care themselves instead of abandoning the patients. And um, there are also broad considerations in terms of thinking about um, ways to incentivize providers to care for patients with chronic painful conditions and substance use disorders. Because I, I think the current landscape um, uh, is such that providers are incentivized not to prescribe because that's what makes them look good. And so what are ways in which you know, pro providers can still prescribe opioids and care for patients with chronic pain and um, substance use disorders without them themselves as providers getting stigmatized for providing that care? And then in summary, um, I, the concerns about PDMPs are credible and warrant attention and response. I also think that PDMPs have utility in the opioid crisis, but perhaps only to a certain point and only for certain outcomes. Uh, PDMPs are not a panacea. Um, multiple factors contributed to the opioid crisis, and I think we should not expect that the PDMPs alone will be the solution, but I think we can definitely expect that they should not make the opioid crisis worse than it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have time for some questions now. I, I ask that uh, if, if you have a question, please wait to be called on and wait for the microphone so that everybody in the room and our audience watching online can hear the question. And please announce your name and affiliation. So if there are any questions, uh, right up front over here. Let's take somebody up front. Oh, OK. All right. <clears throat> I'm Nita Kai at the Mercatus Center. Uh, so this is a question, you know, anybody can take this. Um, one of the things I've noticed is there's this conflation, you know, it's starting from, um, Mr. Fink, you know, you, you started this idea that the problem has to be defined correctly. And it seems to me the problem is defined as addiction. But, the PDMPs focus on opioids, which are medical. The number of chronic pain patients exceed vastly the number of people with substance use disorders. I mean, Ms. Nicholson said 13 million. I've heard estimates as high as 50 million uh, with, you know, with high impact intractable pain. So 13 million was just those who take opioids long term. Definitely yeah. 50 million Americans yeah. have chronic pain and 20 million have high impact pain. Yeah, right. So I'm yeah. in the 13 million. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and um, one of the things is I would really like, let's separate out, you know, I do not have substance use disorder. I have a chronic illness that I and I will have pain until the day I die. Uh, the whole idea of PDMP is looking for your lost keys on the street light, regardless of where you actually lost them. Uh, uh, so what is the purpose of PDMPs? If what you're doing is, you're, yes, you're forcing chronic pain patients into the streets. If you're forcing chronic pain patients into suicide, how are you going to measure the costs that these programs are imposing on chronic pain patients? 
at some point when you look into the benefits and costs of these programs, you need to figure out what are the costs and benefits of these 13 to 20 million Americans who could otherwise you know, be gainfully employed and paying taxes. You know, what are the costs that you're imposing in, in violating our privacy? You know, my dog's vet can access the PDMP and look up my medical information. In what world does that make sense? Now, is, who wants to take that? I mean, I can talk, David? I can talk a little bit to, the, to some pieces of it, and then I'll hand it off probably to other pieces of it. Um, I, I completely agree with you. I think one of the things that's most disheartening about this is that it's sold as a public health tool or, or patient tool, and it ends up being a tool of law enforcement ultimately. And I think that identifying it as a tool of public health or a tool of patient care now has put some onus on somebody, I hope, to actually make it what it should be. Um, and, and I think that's kind of where I start from, is that people are now owed this patient care tool because this thing's not going away, so how can it be modified? Um, and I think the, the other pieces can probably be touched on by <laughs> other people more effectively, but the one other piece I want to do is the measurement part of it is almost impossible. And the worst part is, is that a lot of the measurement stuff that you're talking about, it's too late. So, for example, some colleagues got funded by the NIH recently to look at chronic pain patients and look at their use inside and outside of care. Um, and that study was funded last year. They might be receiving funds now. Um, it's too late. The, the, this, this occurred in 2010, this occurred in 2011, this occurred in 2012. At this point, there's so many people that have been pushed out of care. Um, you're looking at this minority of people that actually were able to maintain care and then what happens with them. Um, and I'm sure, I don't know, it seems like you want. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's true. Uh, I know there is a doctor, uh, Dr. Stephanie Cortez, who I've worked with some who is trying to get funding to at least go back and look at all the suicides that have been reported, that um, have been identified. But it, it is a problem. I mean, it, in measuring overdose deaths, you go to a coroner's report and, and you get a report. I mean, measuring how many people are dropped from the system, there really is no way of capturing that. Um, and it has largely occurred. Already. I mean, people are still experiencing serious burdens of care, but a lot of it um, has already happened. So it is a problem. I mean, definitely the number of people with chronic pain outnumbers, um, I mean, I think 2.6 million Americans have an opioid use disorder. And um, as I said, sort of 20 million have high impact pain, but about 13 million, according to most of the studies, ha actually take opioids for that pain. There are a lot of other treatments for pain and a lot of other people with chronic pain who don't use opioids who use other other things. So, um, you know, it's it's a recalibration. You know, we um, we applied opioids across the board to all types of chronic pain um, uh, fairly liberally in the 90s, and now we're going in very much the other direction, trying, trying to put the genie back in the bottle. And, and I completely agree that it's not just PDMPs, it's the total environment. Um, you know, there are lots of laws and policies. There are so many levels of oversight right now that are really just focused on um, on drug policy and addiction. Yeah. I think it would be helpful not yeah. all of you crisis Yeah, it's an overdose crisis. Yes, I would call it that. There's somebody up front that wanted to get. Uh... First, I want to thank the panel for the great job of articulating the pitfalls. Oh, could you as state well as, your oh, name uh, information? My name is Bruce Blumenthal. I'm a family physician in the Baltimore metropolitan area in Maryland. I uh, also have the privilege of sitting on our state medical society, the MedKai's opioid panel, and we have grappled with every one of these issues that you've articulated so well, um, and obviously have seen many of the same an absolutely identical uh, anecdotal situations. One of the local um, pill mills, and legitimately it was deemed a pill mill, was closed down abruptly. Many of the patients could not find anybody who would take care of them because they were all well above 90 milligram morphine equivalents. And there was a spate of deaths because these people, of course, went out on the street, not surprisingly, and got illicit heroin laced with fentanyl, right. um, you know, all of the things you've discussed are, are spot on. Um, we've grappled with a number of other issues, including what is going to be done about um, identification of patients, in particular uh, the fact that there are folks out there who are identified as 
a problem because they've had some sort of incident where they've lost consciousness and perhaps inappropriately have been labeled as being uh, opioid abusers as opposed to hypoglycemic or having had a stroke because as of right now, the first and presumptive diagnosis of the first responders is the one that ends up following them, sure. uh, which is another area which falls, I think, much more in the legal realm. Um, I guess what I'm, I'm asking is, how do the members of the panel foresee this going forward in terms of correcting the many um, deficiencies and uh, challenges that the PDMP presents to both those of us who are physicians, uh, to the pharmacists, to the law enforcement people, and of course, most importantly, to our patients and the public. Oh, that's yeah. That that's really is this on? Yeah. Okay. That's a really challenging question because, the, as you mentioned, they are the patients who are initially being thought of as having an overdose when maybe something else is happening. And so, one level is just from the first responder perspective, just using that as an example. You know, what are potential ways of um, educating that? You know maybe not to have that individual flagged as, say, having an opioid use disorder or having had an overdose, un unless that's been verified that that indeed, indeed is the case. Um, I'm, I'm actually not sure how um, that would then translate to that patient's record if, for instance, this happened outside the health healthcare system. So that's something that I'm not particularly familiar with. I, can, I want to add to that just a little bit. I think it, part of what your question was is how do you kind of start to change this? And it, it, to start to change it, you start with this. You start with having discussions about it in the open so people become aware of it and change what our population's understanding of these programs are and what our expectations, what we demand from them. And then the second piece of it is then usually a key event. So some big event that po focuses all of our attention onto it. And maybe that's a lawsuit. You know, Maybe that's something that goes up to the Supreme Court. Maybe it's some other piece. But the main thing is that people need to become aware of where their data are right now. And once they, we become aware of where our data are, hopefully you can start to move momentum. And I think that's the bigger piece that we need to do is make more people aware of something and then help mobilize in a way that can hopefully change it. And that's how policy changes ultimately. It is. And I, I would have to say that I've actually been on the Hill a fair amount since April. And I have seen a real shift in policymaker understanding about the complexities and the nuance involved um, in these issues. So I, do, I don't think it's filtered down to the patient level yet and probably not to the physician level. But I, I, do, I have seen palpable uh, change in understanding. I think we have time for one more question. Um, how about uh, on the back on the left? Hello, uh, Daniel Woislaw, I'm an attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Wessler. Uh, I followed Carpenter v. United States very closely as well as the circuit decisions preceding it, and I, I actually read your amicus brief in Jonas, uh, so it's very exciting that you're here today. Uh, my question is about the administrative search exception, uh, which if anybody here doesn't know what that is, there's this exception to the warrant clause, the warrant requirement that says that if an industry is pervasively regulated, uh, then you have a lower expectation of privacy and the government doesn't have to fulfill its obligations under the warrant clause. My question to you, Mr. Wessler, since you've, you've looked at a lot of lawsuits around the country, is whether uh, state and federal courts are adopting this uh, exception for the medical industry going forwards. Yeah, so um, so this exception to the warrant requirement that you're mentioning, it, it started in a, a set of cases about um, junkyards and the mining industry and other industries where the courts, including the Supreme Court, reasoned that they're, they're inherently dangerous or uh, uh, or uh, aspects of the industry or there's like a proclivity to lawlessness, right? So junkyards that might be processing stolen cars, there needs to be a right of law enforcement uh, inspectors to go in without a traditional warrant to do a spot check because that's the only feasible way to make sure that safety regulations are being followed or stolen cars aren't being passed through. Um, there have been a, a set of uh, decisions by state Supreme Courts and federal courts of appeals that have uh, held that pharmacies are closely regulated industries in the same way uh, because there's this whole constellation of record keeping requirements, DEA licensing, state licensing, uh, and because there's potential uh, of dangerousness uh, of, uh, of pharmaceuticals if they're not appropriately taken care of. 
um, and accounted for. Uh, and so that has resulted in a, a lot of the country in the right of state and federal investigators to go to pharmacies with an administrative inspection warrant, quote unquote warrant, it's, a, it's issued by a judge but on a very different easy standard uh, than a traditional search warrant, to check the pharmacy books, make sure that you know, the opioids coming in match the opioids going out, that uh, they aren't diluting the drugs, et cetera. Um, and I, uh, you know, there's a, a little bit of litigation ongoing around that in the actual pharmacy context. The, what I'm concerned about in this context is that that rationale doesn't get just kind of mechanically or rotely extended to the PDMPs, which is, I think, a very different setting, right? It's not, uh, it's not a setting where investigators need to go in and make sure that, you know, the vials of liquid morphine haven't been diluted or that the records of the business, the business's own records are being kept. Rather, this is just a repository of sensitive patient data. It's patient medical records uh, and uh, it's held in a secure state database, right? It's not, you know, the pharmacy manager isn't gonna go like shred the prescription slips before the DEA gets there, right? It's, it's secure. Uh, so it's an appropriate place for a, a higher legal protection. And that's really the core of the, the legal arguments we're making in this New Hampshire case and that we made previously in those other cases. Uh, we're, I'm, I'm sorry to say we're out of time. This was a fascinating and very important discussion. And uh, uh, I hope there'll be more discussion on, I hope this ignites uh, many more discussions on this. Uh, lunch will be held on the second level in a George M. Yeager Conference Center up the spiral staircase. Restrooms are on the second floor. On your way to lunch, look for the yellow wall. Um, out of courtesy, I, I ask you to please allow the speakers to exit the auditorium. They'll be available at lunch to answer any further questions you may have. And thank you all for coming.